and after an excellent lunch in combination with really comfortable chairs and the occasional jet lag, I noticed a gravitational force on the eyelids <laughs> and some members of the audience. So I will spare you a PowerPoint presentation. I will instead build, if I can, a little bit on the excellent panel comments that we've just witnessed that were not just local, they were also of a global nature, including the conversation that we had with your audience. But before we do that, today, is the day to celebrate. And I would like, on behalf of the System Council of the CGIAR, and hopefully also on behalf of all the donors to the SEAT, express our sincere congratulations to your 50th anniversary and what you have achieved for the good of mankind. These are big words, but you have changed tens of millions of people's lives with what you have done in the last 50 years. That's not a small matter. Very few organizations in the world can claim that. And I think this is a, a good moment to celebrate. Ruben, you and your team are doing magical things, and we want to thank you for everything you do every day. Please give them a round of applause again. <clears throat> I believe we don't celebrate enough because there are so many problems we are, we are facing and we are dealing with, but we do need to take the time to reflect Thank our donors, thank the scientists who spend their lives and dedicate their careers and families very often to this cause. I can tell you one thing for sure, the world will need more of it in the future, not less. We have solved a lot of problems, that's clear. We have been able to move from where we were in the early 1970s when SEAT was created and the CGIR was formed. Actually, the CGIR was formed after SEAT. SEAT is not a product of the CGIR. The CGIR is a product of SEAT and SIMIT and IRI and, and the, the uh, initial four centers. Let's not, never forget that. The world has come a long way since 1970s. At that time, everybody was concerned about starvation of a major order of magnitude. Remember Norman Bolog's words? A billion people will die if we don't fix this. I don't think anyone is thinking that way again today. Yes, we will move to 9 billion people, possibly to 10, and if we include the obesity epidemic that we have, the food consumption equivalent probably of more than 10 billion people that will need to be fed. <clears throat> but I don't think most people at the moment are concerned about can we feed those people. But everyone is concerned about it at what cost? What is the price we will have to pay for this? And this is the sustainability question and it's the health and nutrition question. Right? They both came up in the panel very strongly. They are now at the forefront of the global debate. It is very clear, and Martin, we can debate whether it's 10%, the, the total global footprint of, of the agriculture system, or it's 25 or 29. There are different numbers out there. The bottom line is it's way too much. And the opportunity is to actually not only reduce it, but to turn it around completely. There is opportunity out there. We can produce enough food for this planet without a footprint. I'm, I'm convinced after five years looking into this, that if we apply the science, if we believe in technology and innovation for a purpose, that we will get there. It's absolutely conceivable that we can do that if we, if we apply our minds. It will, it'll take money. You know where the solar panel was 30 years ago? Right, it was $10,000 for a piece like this. Now we can produce solar energy in Central Africa at five and a half kilowatt, uh, cents per kilowatt hour five and a half cents per kilowatt hour delivered to the grid. Can you imagine 30 years ago, anybody would have said that, they would have said you're completely out of it, right? So this is happening, it's happening. And I think the CGIR has to play a leading role and a key role and a partnership role in driving this innovation and uh, progress forward. And you're doing this, right? And I wanna come, and I will not talk about CIA too much, but there are two areas where you have been innovators and leaders, in climate change and in nutrition. The Harvest Plus was originated here. This is now one of the most amazing programs that around, and it's just a piece of it, of course. It's just a biofortification piece. But if you do that, you can reach a billion people if we do that now. The, the current head of the director of the, the program is aiming to reach a billion people with biofortification. How cool is that? I think it's amazing that this is possible. And, and, and the, uh, what CCAPS does, and I just, I mean, I don't want to single out, everybody's doing a phenomenal job, but CCAPS has transformed the global debate. A single group of people has basically transformed the global debate in the past three to four years um, around the whole question of climate impact 
both adaptation and mitigation. These country notes are just going like hotcakes. Everybody wants to have one. We at the World Bank fund some of this. Hopefully others will do as well. Wherever we go, people want to know, so what is your current problem? What is your mitigation footprint? Which crops are, which animal systems? What, what, are, what are you doing about it? What are the opportunities? What is practically on the ground doable? And just within a short period of two to three years, we are now spending hundreds of millions. You, you may not even know all of this, Ruben, but we have borrowers now at the World Bank that borrow hundreds of millions of dollars of IBRD money with a serious interest rate to implement the kind of thing that you, are, that you and your team have been doing. China, we have our represent, where are the representatives from China? China is borrow, borrowing 100, it's not a secret, it's public, borrowing 100 million dollars from the World Bank to help China reduce its footprint of rice, wheat, and corn crops in the country. Rapidly moving from a major footprint environment to something that will lead uh, the way forward. You know, you, three years ago, you would have asked me, is that possible? I would have said, no, 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 that's not, that's not, never going to be priority. You know, the world changes very, very quickly. <clears throat> Nutrition, uh, there was a good debate and a good question in the audience in, in the previous panel. <clears throat> I think it came, it came from you. The, the question was, you know, how important is dietary change in the, everything we discuss? The reality is today that the current food system does not work for half the world's population. Every second person on the planet is malnourished. Have you heard that number before? You have heard the 800 million undernourished. You've heard the 160 million stunted children. But when you add it all up, including hidden vitamin deficiencies and the obesity epidemic that's escalating as we speak, it is literally three and a half billion people that are not properly nourished at the moment. And when you actually ask who is really eating properly, it's only 10% of the world's population. 90% of the world's population, they may not have symptoms yet, but they're not eating right by any reasonable uh, standard. So we have a massive, massive task in front of us. And the food system is a part of that. Up until just recently, and this, I have the same conversations within the World Bank because we have a health team and we have a food team. And the health team deals with obesity and deals with sick people and under and malnutrition. But until very recently, they actually had never made the connection that, you know, food has something to do with this. It's not just washing your hands and, you know, and your history and all these other things. It actually, food di dietary diversity has something to do with this. So we're now putting all these pieces together and the food system needs to respond to this. Now, what imp in impacts the food system? You know, and here I'm getting a little more critical. When we do agricultural research in the CGIR, and I'm not, not looking at CR specifically, what are we spending the money on right now? Any, any guess what percentage of the money goes, say, into the kinds of things we should be eating and the kinds of things we should be eating more of and the kinds of things we should be eating less of in our current diets? Anybody wants to venture a guess? <clears throat> okay, so any reasonable dietary guidelines, doesn't matter, the country will tell you that you should be eating sort of 50% fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Right? That's sort of for a balanced diet, makes sense. Yes, you eat your carbs and you eat your protein, but you should be eating a diverse diet. The current budget of the CGIR is less than 10% would be my guess. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Going into fruits, nuts, and vegetables. We don't have a vegetable CGIR center. We don't have a nut CGIR I'm not saying we should have one. I'm just saying we're not doing the research in the kinds of things that people actually should be eating more of. That's the science part. Then look into the policy part. I, I was asking someone before, but I didn't get the answer. I don't know what the agricultural subsidies are in Colombia. Does anybody know the total amount of agricultural subsidies that the support that the government gives to the farmers in the country? Do we know, do you know the, the number roughly? Not, hmm? Like in, in terms of dollars? A couple of billion? I don't know. So I give you the, do you know what it is globally? How, how much subsidies, how much support governments around the world give to their farmers? It's about $580 billion. It's half a trillion plus dollars. And it's not the European Union and the American and uh, US. That's the, that's the big part. It's actually mostly Asia at the moment. So it's a half trillion dollars. And now you guess what percentage of that money is given to the, to the three major grains? And how, what percentage of the money is given to fruits, nuts, and vegetables out of that support? Practically nothing, right? Because we're still stuck in a t at a time 
when it, everything that mattered was to increase food production. Marvel. And I'm not at all arguing against increasing productivity. We need to increase productivity. Don't ever, ever think that it's not important. But it's not the only thing to focus on. And right now what this means is that staple crops are cheaper because they get heavily subsidized, that farmers don't diversify their production, which is the ecological dimension that we discussed, because that's what they get paid for to do. Not necessarily here, but it's, I'm giving you a broader picture of what's going on around the world. If we can shift that amount of support, and I, we're not arguing anymore to reduce, eliminate subsidies. We believe the world needs this kind of investment to get us from where we are today, which is a very high footprint, agriculture that is unsustainable, and an agriculture that does not meet the needs of people in their nutrition and their diet to move them from here to here. So what if that money would be actually used to support a healthy diet, to support a sustainable agriculture? And here I will single out the European Commission that used for many years was always the sort of bad, you know, the, the bad cop in the room because there was input subsidies and all that, but the European have come a very long way in shifting the focus of the way they support their farmers towards these outcomes. As a result of shifting the support to support farmers to do the right thing, which means using more carefully their fertilizer, which actually leads to a reduction in fertilizer and use it more intelligently and with higher precision agriculture, they've reduced the fertilizer used by nearly half in Europe and increased the yield at the same time. In Europe, I'm German, I remember this when I was young, we used to put about 160, 180 kilograms per hectare, for those who are agronomists, per hectare on a wheat field and got seven to eight tons. Today, they're putting 70 kilograms per hectare on the field and get 10 tons. That's progress towards sustainability, right? And it's still only 25% of the entire European Union budget, as you know, but it'll continue to shift. I think it's leading the way, and the rest of the world can do that. Why do I mention policy? Because you know what? The CGIR is also a policy consortium. We have a policy research institute, and we work very closely with the IFPRI in Washington to have these debates. So it's a combination of those things that will be needed to move the needle forward. Let me say one more thing. Um, innovation, disruption, creativity in the space that I've seen in this space that we are discussing over the last two years has been absolutely astounding. Every industry around the world is being disrupted as we speak, not just the taxi drivers with Uber, right? That's a, that's a very good example. And you know what? That's happening in agriculture too. How many of you have heard about the Hello Tractor Company in Nigeria? Three, four, you should all know about this. You know what they do is they Uberize the tractor. For decades, we've been discussing small farm farmers cannot afford a tractor, right? So we need small mechanization. You know what they do now? You pick up the phone. Can, you ha can I have the tractor for half an hour to do my small plot? You know, here's the deal. Two hours later, they're there, deal done. It's all by the cell phone. It's happening in real time. And it's happening in everything we do. And which brings me to this question that came up there around the extension service. Extension services around the world have been so elusive over the last 20 years. They have everywhere that I can think of, with one or two notable exceptions, declined because governments are not putting the money behind it, it's become too expensive, it's not working. Now it's being disrupted. We just had a case where we were in a village in Malawi, in, in the middle of nowhere, and there was a disease in a cornfield, and the woman there had a cell phone, and she took, put, took a picture of the disease, it was a, smut, a corn smut disease, took a picture on the internet, identified the disease right there and then, together with the recommendations what to do with it. And everybody now has a cell phone. And within the next three years, there will be 4G everywhere. That's what the tech folks say. So I think if we anticipate that, we need to rethink the way we think about extension. It can't be the way it's been done in the last 40 years. And the same will happen in many other spaces. It's just across the board. There is innovation disruption. We've held two innovation fairs at the World Bank just in the last six months, and we're going to continue to do this at, at, at a speed unprecedented. Because what you see is so phenomenally quickly transforming things that it, it's just mind boggling. I'll give you one more example in Rwanda. Uh, you know what they do with drones? Everybody's heard about drones, of course, right? And then, yeah, you know what? Drones take nice pictures and stuff, but it's not the point. You know what they do there in Rwanda with drones? They supply blood to remote villages with a drone. So you get a phone call from a village, there's an accident, somebody needs blood. They put this, this little bag under the drone put the GPS coordinates in, it's not manual, put it in, send it off, and this is 70 kilometers away, 
supply the blood, drop it right in front of the hospital on, on the floor, and the drone comes back. In a, in a place where you, know, you can talk about infrastructure all day long, it will take a long time until every village is, is connected to the road. And in agriculture, it's the same. What's stopping us in five or 10 years from now to have a little seat bag and drop one in every small plot? In some of the villages, they don't even, never even heard of it. I'm just spinning it out. I think the message is for the CGIAR, we will get disrupted as well as an organization. Everyone is getting disrupted at the moment. It's not just Macy's and Nordstrom's in the US or the taxi drivers. We will, we will get disrupted. Agricultural research will, be, will change the way it's done. And we can either be with it, behind it, ahead of it. You know, we can either try to avoid it, or we can be a huge part of it. Right? And I'm, I'm sure I know where Ruben and his team will go. Thank you. Thank you.